Uh, so I'm Jerome Pocenti. I'm actually uh, an Archie Cube. I'm a, a student from here. I'm actually, I came here in mathematics. Uh, actually, when I joined, I kind of hated computers. Didn't want to have anything to do with them. Uh, then I did my uh, PhD in uh, arithmetic geometry. Realized that only five people in the world actually had read my PhD. So I decided to do something in parallel. I did some uh, philosophy and some uh, cognitive science. And then I went to uh, Pittsburgh, to Carnegie Mellon University, to, to do my uh, cooperation, actually, at the time. And I ended up uh, doing some uh, computer science there and starting a company in uh, June 2000. And I sold that co so a company in the kind of AI text mining search space. And then I sold it to IBM in 2012. And then my company and myself were included in a group that's called Watson Group. I don't know if you've heard of it. I'll show you a little bit uh, in 2014. So now I'm actually a, a VP there. I'm a development manager. I have a big team of around 300 researchers and developers developing anything from question and answering to speech recognition to dialogue. Uh, lots of actually very fun technologies and I'll show you a few things. Okay. What's interesting in that space is that you know, I've been in kind of an AI-related space for, I want to say, 18 years now. And if you had asked me five years, six years ago, where we would be today, uh, I wouldn't have guessed. I think actually the field has improved tremendously in the past five years beyond actually my own expectations. Um, and I think it's pretty remarkable. So the goal of my talk is not going to be very technical, and I'll spend just like 40 minutes so to leave a lot of questions. It's kind of to show you, hey, some stuff is happening. It's kind of cool. Uh, and maybe if you're interested in doing an internship in the U.S., uh, we can think about that. Um, we are kind of a recruiting and inter interested in people, so uh, I have a vested interest in being here. But I wanted to kind of show you that it's an interesting field. There's lots of things happening. I'm going to talk a little bit about like, you know, neural networks and what's going on there. Nothing very technical, but we can go uh, in the discussion in more, in, in more details. So the thing, one of the things that happened in the past five years is Watson. Let me show you a little video here. You're just a little stiff. You don't have this painful mosquito-borne joint illness with a Swahili name. Watson? What is dengue fever? Dengue fever, correct. That's your fruit for 1,200. Paganini's 24 Capricci set the standard for etudes for this instrument. Watson? What is violin? Good. 2,000, same category. From 1911 to 1917, this romantic Russian composed etude tableau for piano. Watson, who is Rachmaninoff? Rachmaninoff is correct, and that adds to your lead. You're at 13,400. Go again. Don't worry about it. For 1,200, you just need a little more sun. You don't have this hereditary lack of pigment. Watson, what is albinism? Good. Cambridge for 1,600. And there you go. What are you going with? I'll wager $6,435. I won't ask. I won't ask. Here's the clue for you, Watson. The chapels at Pembroke and Emmanuel Colleges were designed by this architect. Who is Sir Christopher Wren? You are right. And All right. Anybody in the room seen that video before? Oh, nobody. Okay, interesting. You can find it on YouTube. So it was an interesting event, you know, happened in the US. The interesting piece is that the two players that you see there, so this is a game, I don't know if you know Jeopardy, it's like uh, question pour un champion, but kind of reverted. It's very popular in the US. The two guys there were very, very popular at the time because they had won millions of dollars playing that game. One of them actually had won like, I think more 150 games in a row. So he was supposed to be, you know, the absolute best player in that game. And obviously at the end, Watson ended up uh, winning. It was actually a grand challenge that IBM had taken. It was kind of interesting. They had decided for the centennial of IBM to try to take on that grand challenge. When they went on live TV, this was live, okay, they had calculated they had a 75% chance of winning, and they did win. Okay. After that, that created a lot of interest, commercial interest, for these kind of technologies. And IBM kind of jumped on the PR and started to do things with it. And you know, I'll, I'll show you a few examples. And then in 2014, so and that's where I kind of came in, they decided to double down and bring a lot of researchers. IBM has a big research center in New York, bring a lot of researchers in that space around what they call cognitive technology, and I'll show you a few things. Now, 
what's interesting about this technology is, is that, okay, how does it work? How do you create a system like what's on the, the, by the way, the papers I published, this is kind of old news at this point, I'm gonna go kind of beyond, but I wanna kind of show you a little bit the, the system and how it works. So it's not the way you would kind of intuitively approach the problem is to say, okay, I take the question, I try to convert it into kind of a question that the computer can understand, and I'm gonna use that to traverse a very large knowledge base to kind of find the answer, okay? Uh, that's not at all how Watson works, actually. Watson kind of embrace the mess, if you want, and I'll go into some more detail, but it's a very statistical system. So it doesn't generate only one answer, it generates actually hundreds of potential answers, candidates, and then for each of these candidates, it's gonna generate hundreds and hundreds of, of evidences, you know. Is there a good match between the candidate and the answer? What, what tells us it's the right one? And then it's gonna score these evidences using kind of a machine learning model. It's gonna to learn to figure out which, are, which evidence have the highest weight. And then it's gonna basically rank these candidates and give you the answer. That's a very, very high level. But the key aspect is that this is a statistical system at the heart. Now there is actually a very long, I'll go back a little bit in history. IBM actually has a very long history in what I call statistical machine learning. And it started in the, in the, in the 70s with a guy called Fred Jelinek. Now there's a funny story about that guy, uh, which is, you know, this is a little bit of a myth, though I, I've heard the story is kind of true. So, you know, at the time in the 70s, when he tried to attack that problem, there was a lot of influence from Chomsky, you know, and the idea of universal grammar. So the idea is that anything you wanted to do with language, you had to kind of understand the deep structure, uh, and, and, you know, the universal syntax and, and semantic of the language, and that's the way you would attack the problem. So, uh, Fred Jelinek actually came from uh, signal processing, and so he kind of applied more of an information theory view as well as a linguistic view. So he hired some linguists and some engineers to try to tackle the problem. Now the story goes that one day, uh, one of his linguists actually quit, and he noticed that a few weeks later, the performance of the system actually improved. So then he went to see another linguist and convinced him to kind of go find a, a job somewhere else. And sure enough, a few weeks later, the performance of the system improved again. And the story goes that one by one, he fired all his linguists, replaced them all by engineers, and got the best speech recognition system at the time, okay. Now to understand how that worked, you know, speech actually systems, again, this is all documented out there, you can see them, are quite complex, but the same team actually apply the same kind of technique to machine translation. I think machine translation is one of the easiest statistical system to understand, okay. Now again, if you were to try to do automated machine translation, uh, I imagine, you know, you would say, okay, I'm gonna take, uh, you know, the, the, the formulation in one language, convert it to some kind of universal view of that language, map it to the other language, understand the syntax, the semantic, and then, you know, do this mapping between the two languages at the level. Well, it happens that that doesn't work very well, and in the 90s, the same team apply a purely statistical method, which is basically you take something like a corpus of translation, a Rosetta Stone, and you use a very simple method. You look at a sequence of words, let's say three words, okay, and you say, what are the uh, translation in my corpus? The most probable translation of these three words, okay? And then you move that window from one word and you take the next three words, or you know, the overlapping window of three words, and you find against the most probable, probable translation, and then you have a chain, you chain them, right? And using you know, hidden Markov chains, you basically try to find the most probable path, and it's a bit of an optimization problem, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, basically you use no linguistic to solve the problem. In the 90s, you know, the team came up with this, uh, had much better performance again, than what was done using more linguistic heavy techniques. It was a big scandal, you know, the linguists were up in arms, they couldn't believe it. But today, and this is actually called the IBM model, because it was done by IBM, uh, this is what's used, is, is responsible for most of the accuracy in a translation model when you use Google Translate or, or other system. Now when you put the two together, you get a system like this. This is something that my team did like five years ago. Would you like to book a one way or round trip ticket? A round trip ticket returning on the 23rd of August. So, you know, we're starting to make actually very good progress in this field, okay? Let me go one step beyond. There's actually a field today, and I'm sure you've heard about it, that's very, very hard, it's called deep learning. And I would consider that kind of the next generation of 
uh, statistical machine learning. So you know, deep learning is basically these uh, high deep neural networks with lots of nodes. I mean, neural networks have been, artificial neural networks have been around for a long time. In the 50s or 60s, people came up with the concept. In the 60s, someone proved that you couldn't do anything useful with them. Uh, and then, you know, in the 80s and 90s, a few uh, uh, people stuck with it, including a French guy called Yann, Le Yann Lequin, and decided to still try to apply it to some problems while everybody was ignoring, including me, thinking these guys were crazy and it was a completely useless uh, uh, type of processing. Now, they applied it. The first kind of very interesting application was to apply these neural networks to uh, digit recognition on letters. You know, when you send a letter, you try to figure out the zip code automatically. The, interesting, the reason why it's a good task is because if you try to extract features uh, to try to detect what the numbers are, it doesn't work very well because numbers have lots of variations and it's hard to determine what are the features that, that uh, specify a given numbers. So you throw that at a neural network and the system, this is kind of representation, comes up with some, some very kind of like, you know, low level evidences, some, some filters to figure out what number is what. Okay? It's hard actually to figure out exactly what it's doing but it works pretty well. Now the real eye-opening application was actually in the mid 2000s. So again, you know, last 10 or not 10 years, when people started to apply that to a task that people had gone after for now 40 years, this is the same task I mentioned earlier, which was speech recognition. So I think the first one was Microsoft, used actually neural network, and they made actually a small improvement replacing the hidden Markov models with actually uh, deep neural nets and managed to beat uh, the, uh, uh, the best performance. That was actually quite eye-opening because people didn't think you could do anything serious with neural networks at the time. And since then, improvement have been coming steadily and steadily. So my team actually just yesterday released a new uh, result. This is actually speech, so this is open speech over the phone. And they just published something that says that our error rate is 8%, okay? Using more advanced and more refined, you know, uh, recurrent and convolutional neural networks, okay? So uh, there's a new result here, it's just 8%. To give you an idea, for the same kind of task, humans are around 4, four or 5% error rate. So we're getting close. Now there are some tasks where, oops, let me actually, this. There are some tasks where we are actually getting closer or even ready to beat human performance. So that's, I'm, I'm sure some of you may have heard of this, this is ImageNet. Uh, the idea there is you have, this, this is a corpus of 10 million images and you need to classify them in 3,000 uh, different classes. Pretty specific classes like, you know, container ship, leopard, mite, uh, cherry, etc., etc. Now, when they started attacking that task with the neural nets, in 2010, the error rate was around 28%, okay? And in just five years, it went down to, I think this is a Google result, around 7%. And I think just a few months ago, or even a month ago, Baidu released one result where they're actually beating human performance in a classification task. Now, there's even more interesting little task here, which is this one I really like because it's CAPTCHA, okay? Uh, you know CAPTCHAs, they are made to uh, basically separate humans from computers. What happens is that Google bought the company, actually came from CMU, from, from Google, uh, from Pittsburgh, uh, and they also created now a system that's able to to break CAPTCHAs better than humans, uh, which is obviously <laughs> makes this CAPTCHA completely useless. And you may have seen they actually are replacing the system by doing some machine learning on behavioral, uh, uh, you know, mouth moving, et cetera, et cetera, to determine if you are human or not. So they are, basically the system is completely useless at this point. You know, another task which is kind of interesting is, you know, uh, I think this is from last year, Facebook again, neural network, apply that to uh, face recognition. This requires usually a lot of examples, Nicely, actually, Facebook has a lot of examples of faces of your friends, but if they have enough examples, they're able to actually recognize them on new pictures better than you do. So again, you know, this is a task, as I mentioned earlier, where if you had asked me five years ago, you know, is, is face recognition around the corner? I would have guessed not. But basically, we have this engineering around these neural networks that's working really, really well, and people are able to kind of get results, sometimes a little bit in a, so I could have a bunch of slides, which I don't have because I didn't make this very technical, uh, about you know, how these neural network works or how they don't work. So we have a lot of very weird results also about neural networks. So if you take an image task, you know, like the image that they have, there were some papers that published where you can add a, a little uh, modification to these images, even actually I think the same modification to all the images, 
and it will actually completely change the class. So to humans, it looks exactly like the same image, but I change a few pixels, and I can make the neural network go completely berserk, okay? So the funny thing is, this neural network, have, you know, the math behind it is not very well understood. It just works very well, but it's kind of complex math. It's not very clean. And, uh, you know, so it's kind of, a, I want to say, it's a bit of a cooking at this point, uh, an engineering task, and it works very well, but, you know, the, the theory is kind of behind. Let me show you a few things that actually, so I'm going to shift back here and kind of show you what uh, IBM is doing with this kind of technology. So, you know, IBM is in it to make money. Uh, we are trying to actually commercialize what we call this kind of cognitive revolution, this cognitive computing. So we're trying to create a system which actually learn, you know, that are very much based on natural language. And so when we can tackle natural language, there are certain things we can do. So let me give you, show you a few videos. Oops, I'm trying to think again. Dr. Mark Noy. Oh, oops, there we go. Sorry. Every great discovery in human history started with a moment of inspiration. Finding inspiration in today's world involves not only understanding what you can see and touch, but the massive amount of data and insight being generated every millisecond. Connecting the dots was easier when the dots were right in front of you. It's much more difficult when the dots are generated by billions of documents in unrelated industries spread all over the world. The next great innovations will come from people who are able to make the connections that others can't put together. Introducing the IBM Watson Discovery Advisor. Pinpointing facts and analyzing information from tens of millions of books, online articles, and other unstructured data sources that no one person could understand in a hundred lifetimes, unveiling the hidden connections, leading you down new lines of thinking, interacting and communicating the way you do, understanding context, wordplay, and even puns while learning the language of your industry or profession. A powerful computing solution that gives experts the confidence to make new connections, then crack the code on advancements that were previously unthinkable. In the fight against cancer, Watson helped identify new target proteins in a matter of weeks, not years, significantly increasing the opportunity to discover new and effective treatments. In law enforcement, Watson can ingest details on thousands of cases, helping police officers develop new strategies to solve the toughest criminal investigations. Even chefs are getting in on the action, unlocking new flavor combinations no palate has ever savored. Austrian chocolate burrito or a Vietnamese apple kebab, anyone? In other industries as well, finance, retail, government, manufacturing, energy, education. Watson is forging new partnerships between humans and computers to enhance, scale, and accelerate human expertise. It's a new dawn of discovery, and Watson is the spark. What will you discover with Watson? So it's a bit of a salesy video, but the, the key is to show you uh, the kind of capabilities. So here's the, here's the understanding behind it, is that if you can create a software that can go into text, right, and understanding some relationships, some meanings, I mean, actually, the principle behind Discovery Advisor is pretty simple. You ingest a lot of text in a certain domain, and you're going to start extracting and identifying the entities behind it. So if you are, for example, in life sciences, you try to identify, you know, drugs, protein, genes, uh, out of that. And then you, in, you identify also the interaction, and you normalize them between these different uh, entities. And then you can create an interface on top of it to basically uh, agglomerate all that data across you know, these 10 or 100 million documents to basically make connections between these different entities and navigate them or query them, you know, ask, ask factual, uh, a factual query about it. So that's a real product. We're trying to apply that. We actually have two domains we're going after right now. One is life science, the other one is you know, intelligence, you know, uh, looking after you know, open source information and finding connection between people and, and, and facts. Now, a little more, kind of even more advanced system is around uh, medical. Let me show you another video. Ah, oh, you're kidding me. I'm not going to play the other cells video. Okay. He's preparing to see a patient. He logs into the electronic medical record, and instead of spending time trying to find relevant information, he uses the IBM Watson Oncology Diagnosis and Treatment Advisor. He pushes the Ask Watson button and Watson analyzes the patient data against tens of thousands of documents from its vast body of medical literature. 
Dr. Norton starts with the case information tab where Watson has pulled out the relevant information, as well as suggestions for additional information to gather. Moving to the test options tab, he sees tests that Watson suggests that he consider ordering. He presses the evidence button to see the reasons why Watson suggested the first test. Then he drills down further into a specific reference that supports the suggestion. Once the results of the tests come in, Dr. Norton presses the treatment options tab to see a panel of suggested confidence score treatments. He also sees a list of clinical trials to consider. Again, he reviews the supporting documentation by pushing the evidence button. Dr. Norton has new information to add to the case, so he pushes the blue Watson avatar on the bottom and speaks directly into the microphone. He makes sure that his words have been transcribed correctly and submits the new information. Watson returns a revised set of confidence score treatment suggestions that take the new information into account. It also updates the list of clinical trials to consider. Shifting gears from Dr. Gordon's role to that of a hospital or health plan administrator, the advisor provides a customizable dashboard showing key performance indicators like where the advisor is being used, how it's performing, and what information sources are most useful. The administrator can drill down into the data more specifically to get more details, such as performance over different time spans, metrics on specific types of cancer, or in this case, a narrower geographic area. This is just one of the many areas that Watson's cognitive capabilities can be applied to help people live and work in better ways. So this gives you an idea, okay, if you can interpret a patient record, which is usually some text uh, 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 that a doctor entered, and then if you can interpret literature, you know, publications about treatments or clinical trials, you can start doing the match automatically. So the system is designed to assist doctors that when they look at a patient record, the system analyzes the text of the patient record, find the important components, and then match it to the clinical trials or to the treatment, and give the confidence score because it was going to tabulate all the literature available. So that's kind of, this, kind of this, this example. Now, the strategy of IBM is kind of interesting, is that we are trying to expose all these capabilities through cloud services. So if you go today, there's something called Watson Developer Cloud, where well, you can use it, so we have things like, you know, speech recognition I mentioned before, machine translation, question and answering, natural language parsing, and the idea is to expose all these core capabilities as services that anybody can use. Uh, startups, we have like we're working with 300 different startups, students, researchers, uh, and established companies. So we're trying to have an open platform where people can build on top of it, and we're trying to to create some kind of core components. There are some fun stuff in there as well. There is a, a, a service called Personality Insight, and the idea is that you feed it like your Twitter handle and what you have written, and the system will come up with a psychological profile. And that's based on published literature. You know, the system is able to predict, based on what you write, better than chance, uh, what are your kind of main characteristics from a psychologi psychological standpoint. So this is kind of things we can do. I mean, there are actually interesting applications where we're trying to go. You wouldn't imagine, but Africa is one of the big places where we're investing because we feel like, well, it's a place where there's not much infrastructure. So if you don't have doctors, it's very easy to replace them. Uh, and so it's the same way that, uh, you know, mobile phones are very popular in Africa because there's no landlines. So actually, you can apply this kind of technology in places you wouldn't imagine. And then there are fun stuff we're doing, like Debater. This is the next version of uh, Watson. So we're trying to create a system that you give it an argument and it can it can argue pros and cons, you know. So it's kind of a modern gorgeous, if you want, you know. It's a perfect sophist. You will give it any kind of argument. It will find, in Wikipedia mostly right now, arguments for, arguments cons. Perfect tool to use with your wife or your partner, you know. Um, so I have two more sets of slides. The first one I want to tell you, a more or less uh, salesy here, and tell you a little bit about some of the challenges of developing this system. So the key aspect of developing a system is really there's a methodology problem. So I assume some of you are familiar with developing software. You know, developing software of good quality is quite a hard challenge. But here, uh, when you develop this cognitive system, you basically have another dimension. It's not just functional quality. It's how accurately it, it performs. And it's not actually easy to do that. So when the team, you know, this is a Jeopardy team, started to approach the problem, you know, this is kind of the precision recall 
of, uh, of the system at the time in 2007. You know, this was a performance the system uh, gave, okay? And the human performance was high up there, okay? Uh, so there, it was actually very, very far from uh, being able to solve the problem. As I mentioned, when they attacked the problem, they didn't try to solve it in a kind of very structured way. They didn't try to convert queries into structure. They kind of embraced the mess, okay? They embraced the ambiguity. They didn't try to build a big knowledge base. They tried to embrace the diversity of information. So I'm not going to go into detail, but you know, I mentioned that before. They basically keep the data very messy, try to create evidences, candidates, and then you know, apply machine learning models to it. Now the challenge, you know, when they did it, is that after they had this score, so they had lots and lots of different heuristics to create a system like this. And the problem when you have a team that's generating all these different heuristics to try to solve the problem is that you may add a heuristic and it may sound good for a handful of queries, but it may actually crater your score on the other uh, things. So the very challenge is that it's very easy to create systems that look like they work well for a part of the data because that's where you test it, but actually overall uh, it doesn't work very well. And so there's lots of challenges where you basically need to really have a methodology uh, to keep improving. The important thing is the system will keep improving, but it keeps improving on something you don't see because you want to predict your performance during the game. In this game, the game with question you haven't seen yet. So there's a whole system of trying to keep a blind set, you know, a set of uh, uh, questions on which you do experiments. But there's lots of challenges around that because, as you may know, the more often you do experiment on that data, the more you discover about that blind set, which means you can start cheating because you can start learning and uh, you know, doing validation on the data you're not supposed to. So there's lots of challenges to develop software that have this new dimension of accuracy. And so the team put together this kind of you know, uh, methodology that was basically based on lots of, you know, they were li reading literature, finding good ideas, they were prioritizing them, dividing the work between them, and they were running experiments after experiment, experiment. And the funny thing is they were not just running experiments of adding new algorithms, they were also running experiments of removing algorithms. So they were doing ablation to remove to see, well, actually, if I remove this, the system still perform. But the key is they really had this kind of experimental background, keep testing their hypothesis, and every time someone would add something else, they would retest the whole system on some data they had not seen. Now, the advantage that team had is that they were all in one place, which is you know, a lab in, in New York, Yorktown Heights. Now, my team now has some very interesting problems because we're trying to kind of take this kind of technology, which are you know, developed in a kind of scientific way, and apply it now and try to commercialize it. But the problem is, imagine it was hard enough to try to apply that to one task, which was to answer a question in Jeopardy. Now I need to figure out, how do I create a system that answers a question in finance, answer a question in healthcare, answer a question for intelligence, and I don't want to have to develop three different systems. But the meaning of words and the heuristics I use may have different performances in the three different domains. So that's a very hard problem, you know. How do you create uh, uh, a system that works in different domains? The other problem is my team is all over the world because, you know, as we're scaling this system, we have team in, in Tokyo, in Prague, in Dublin, in New York, you know, in California. So how do you get people to collaborate and understand what everybody is doing? So there are lots of challenges around this. And we need to obviously experiment with data that we don't have. Uh, the challenge is in the case of uh, Jeopardy, you had basically a ground truth, which was you had a set of questions that was done, you know, there were a history of questions and there were strict answers. What we find is that when you try to develop a system in uh, the real world, while there's not so often a real answer or one answer for a question, there may actually be many answers. And often when we work with customers, you know, they always judge, you know, they're very harsh in how they judge our system, how well it answers the questions. But what we found is that they don't actually judge harshly their own experts. And what we find is that when ex if you ask two experts to answer the same question, very often they're agreement, you know, what we call the inter annotator agreement, is actually not very good. And sometimes it's around 60%, 70%, which means you'll never be able to get above that because you are asking them to be your judges. And if the judges don't agree, you cannot get uh, above that, that agreement threshold. So lots and lots and lots of challenges. And, you know, we're trying to solve, you know, this. One thing we're doing, and I'll talk about it after, is we are, we are trying to basically use non-domain specific algorithm and use very robust algorithm. And that's where uh, neural networks come back in the picture. We have found that using neural networks for language 
is the best way to do that. So my team actually took the Jeopardy pipeline, which is in the system that actually bit the, the best to play are Jeopardy, and replaced the algorithm with actually neural network. At the time, they didn't use them. Now we're using neural network to understand you know, how similar language is. You know, we do this kind of what's called language embeddings and try to figure out, okay, if you have two paragraphs or two sentences, are they meaning the same thing? Okay. So we try to use very uh, robust techniques. Okay. And we're trying to divide up the problem in small pieces. We're trying to apply, you know, there's a Spotify video out there, if you've ever seen. We divide our team in what's called squads. You know, they own a piece of the problem and they try to solve it. You know, and they have all authority of our solving it. And we're trying to collect data, which is very challenging. This is one of the hardest problems. So we try to be creative in collecting data using crowdsourcing, sometimes Mechanical Turk, uh, sometimes targeted crawls. So there's lots of problems around this. And you know, one thing we can't avoid is we try to hire, we have to hire people with a pretty strong background uh, in science. Okay? And that's one reason I'm here again. Uh, and so we are trying to find people with kind of a, a strong mind, understand this notion of experimentation. Uh, it's not just uh, software development, you know, it's really about uh, scientific advances. Now that's the engineering problem. Now from an exciting stuff standpoint, what are we doing? So we're actually trying to kind of break the boundaries uh, and again using these neural networks. So the first one I mentioned it before is try to apply that to natural language. That's really the next boundary. There are very good results in speech, very good results in images, but everybody feels that you know, applying neural network to natural language is the next frontier. And what we'll be able to do that, we'll have a really better understanding, kind of this, how can I say, this kind of a subtle understanding of a language, you know, understanding all this variation. Language is a structure, but if you try to parse it too early, if you try to kind of impose it, it's always too naive. And so you want to create this kind of view of the language that gives you this kind of subtlety to handle all the variations, okay? So that's something we're working a lot and making good progress in publishing in the, in the domain. Another fun stuff is that neural networks are actually pretty good at handling, as I say, speech, language, uh, uh, images, and we're starting to combine that. So I have a team actually that took the, uh, the input so, uh, from a video of the lips as well as the audio and tried to do speech recognition. Now, it happens that humans actually read lips. Uh, if you're in a very noisy environment, you get a significant improvement uh, rate in recognition uh, for humans by looking at the lips of the speaker. And we're able to create systems today using neural networks that can actually read the lips as well as humans in the sense that they get as much improvement in error rate from the lips as humans do. Now, they were still not matching human performance, but we're not very far from it. So that's one aspect. My gut feeling is that, you know, looking at videos is really the next frontier, not just actually for video's sake, not just for understanding images or videos, but also to understand language. Because the meaning uh, and sense of, this, uh, uh, of the words really reflects back to the experiences of people when you experience this word. So one of the things we're trying to explore is how can you represent words you know, in, a, in a continuous space by training the system through you know, images or videos or more something that's more in the domain of experience rather than just by, the, uh, by looking at a combination with other words. And when you put it all together, it's kind of an interesting image that's happening. And this is what I'm going to, is that, you know, we are actually starting to build these models, you know, that do signal processing for audio, signal processing for uh, images, and then we combine these networks. Usually it's not one network, we actually combine these network. Some networks that do language understanding, you can see where it's going, where we have these systems that if you try to make them more general, start looking much more like, you know, a modular brain. Uh, now the neural networks are kind of naive, representation of neuron, they're not meant to be exactly like this. But it's kind of interesting that there are these things performing the best today, uh, even though for a long time people didn't believe in it. And they have kind of this modular uh, combination that really you know, seems to, to match what's happening in the brain. So there are some you know, interesting problems here and it sounds we're going somewhere. Now if you want to be a little more, uh, you know, make some big statements which I'm not gonna make, you can start comparing what is network, uh, uh, the size of this network with the brain, okay? And today we are pretty much at a ratio of 100,000. So the biggest network, you're talking about potentially th thousands of, of servers, uh, can represent uh, a neural network with a million nodes and billions of connections, okay? That's what we can do today uh, by scaling across servers. And the brain at this point is something around 100 billion 
um, uh, well, at this point, it's, all, it's been for a while, 100 billion, <laughs> 100 billion neurons and 100 trillion connections. So there's a factor of 100,000. You know, if you apply a simple uh, Moore's law, you're talking at 25 years to 35 years, okay? Now, that doesn't mean, obviously, that uh, we'll be as flexible as the brain in, in 35 years, but, you know, if you want to have a little metrics, it's kind of interesting to look at that. If, I, if you ask me, I'll tell you, no, we won't. Uh, get there, but you know, if you had asked me five years ago, I would have told you it wouldn't be where we are today. So I'm not the the right judge. Anyway, that's my uh, that's my presentation. Questions? Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, you say that uh, you say that the biggest uh, neural network has billions of connections. But uh, is there a, a big enough annotated and labeled data set uh, not for the network to get uh, underfitted? Well, it depends. I mean, you know, uh, there are some big data sets that you can use. I mean, the, the size of the network is not necessarily dependent on the size of the data, right? Uh, I mean, there is an interesting correlation there. And I, actually, it goes maybe beyond. It's actually kind of interesting that my view of a neural network is that they allow you to have lots of parameters without overfitting. Okay, so even when you don't have that much data, you can actually train it on a large network and it works better than a small network. I mean, there's a lot more theory than this. So, so, sorry, so yes, there's, I mean, there's a lot of data. And actually right now, uh, we're looking at you know, using videos and that becomes a lot of data very quickly that you could use, okay? And you can find ways to annotate it. Okay, so I, I don't think we are reaching limits. And then you have people like Google who have lots of money and they just employ, you know, literally thousands of people doing annotation. That's, that's the dirty secret of Google, is that they actually have a whole army of people. I, I, I suspect it's actually in the tens of thousands doing annotation for them. So it's not a problem. They will just go out there and annotate the data. I wish they would share it, but uh, they don't. Other questions? Yes? Can you give some details about the kind of natural language processing techniques you are developing or using? Yeah, so I mean, the, uh, at the most basic, uh, we're trying to do uh, relationship extraction, entity recognition, and we use a uh, statistical model for that. So you know, the, uh, one of the key building blocks is you have annotated data, you learn from it. So you learn new entities from that, okay, from example. Uh, we're starting to also do that and try to you know, basically feed some text in, in a system and learn from, uh, you know, kind of unsupervised uh, signal. So, for example, in a big corpus, you're going to have things like tables or is a, a, a relationship. So you can start learning and bootstrapping uh, the models or, you know, the entities through some uh, cues that you get in the data. And then we take that and then we create a graph out of that and then we feed it back into the system to train it. So we're trying to become more and more unsupervised. So that's one uh, domain. And then the other domain is what I mentioned is around using uh, neural networks. So we are using today, you know, Google came up with word to vec I don't know if you're familiar with that. So it's language embedding, right? So you take a word, try to represent a continuous space, so it gives you kind of a distance between the two words, okay, how similar they are. We're trying to do the same thing with uh, uh, sentences and paragraphs, okay? So then you feed into the system. It's kind of very interesting. You can feed a lot of different signal including some of the parsing signal into the neural network to try to do these this, uh, embeddings. And then there's some thinking that you can start going beyond that and look at dialogue. So we'd like to basically learn, so we do some, I would say, simpler thing for dialogue, like um, uh, you know, ellipsis resolution and FRI resolution. We're trying to do frame-based dialogue, so you, know, you can ask people to give you four pieces of information and then you know, any kind of combination, they can give it to you. But then what we'd like to do also is to start learning from examples in dialogue. So you feed the system a bunch of, uh, of dialogue and the system will learn how to respond from that. Okay, so th that's a kind of, uh, and there are techniques that people use. If, I mean, if you look at recurrent neural networks, they're pretty good at trying to kind of make up stuff based on examples. Uh, one of my little pet projects there is to, would be to do kind of a, an IMA on Reddit, so I'm you know, talking to these guys and say, hey, can we put a neural network out there doing an IMA and see what it does and ultimately 
putting Watson out there to do it uh, as well. So lots of lots of uh, research. You know, another one is, as I mentioned, is around uh, multimodal. So can you answer a question through uh, other modalities? And the nice thing with these embeddings is that you can actually kind of train them with uh, pictures or videos or other modality. And so then after, it's actually quite easy. There are people doing that, for example, for uh, um, picture labeling, where you have these sentences. You know, so you generate sentences to describe what's in the picture. Uh, what we're trying to do is the opposite, which is you, know, you ask a question, you answer with a picture. You know? So lots, there are lots of stuff, actually. Really, the field is kind of exploding in this moment. Because you have these tools, you know, especially like a recurrent neural network, because this tool that can generate a bunch of crap that seems to work pretty well. You know, there is stuff that it's not crap actually; it's kind of interesting stuff. So if you can tackle them, you can do a lot of interesting things with it. Sorry, long answer for a short question. Other questions? Could you have an idea of what looks like uh, one cell of your neural, neural network? Uh, I'm one sorry? Cell. What looks like one cell of your network? What looks like? One, one cell. cell. Oh, you mean like what, what happens at the one what, cell? What looks like what is a cell is, is what? No, so today that's actually an interesting thing. The, the cells, you know, are really just uh, pretty simple, right? I mean, what we... What we train when you train a network is just the weights, right? So the model of propagation is, is quite simple. Many people actually think, and then you know, we, we train this through backprop. I don't know if you know. So the, the model of the network is not made to reproduce actually human behavior. Actually, we even know that the, the brain doesn't work the way we train our networks at all. So it's a very simplified view. Just works well and looks like it. Uh, I don't know if that was your question. So after people do, you can find on the, on the way where people try to see what's the activation of each node. You know, when are they activated? And they try to kind of interpret that. But what I find very interesting is you never can quite pinpoint what happens. And it's very weak signal that's interpreted by each neuron. And sometimes you can interpret it. But you know, when you look at people doing this, so you have a network of like, you know, let's say 100,000 nodes. And they'll pick like a dozen. And they'll say, oh, that looks like it's interpreting this. Or it looks like it's interpreting that. But then you ask, OK, what about the uh, 99,990 you didn't pick? What are they doing? So it's kind of easy. So you know, it's, not very, it's honestly not very uh, convincing and not very uh, satisfying, actually. But maybe there's not much more to it. I mean, it's, you know, actually, it's a lot of weak signals, actually. So you know, the, the behavior of one node is not that interesting. I don't know if I answer your question or. Were you asking to try to say if the, the node should behave in a more advanced way, like more neuron? Yeah, no, right at this point, we're very, uh, very limited. Actually, one thing that I find very interesting is that we don't, the model right now is to um, train and then uh, execute, OK? But the brain doesn't work like this, right? Because the brain learns as it recalls things, right? So where here, you, know, you basically train your system where it changes, and then you use it, and nothing changes, right? The brain doesn't work like this. Another thing that our brain does is that you can learn from one example, which is networks don't work at all this way. Like you really have to train with a huge amount of data. So, so there are lots of concepts that have not been applied. You know. The concept of memory, we're starting to try to do that, you know, changing this. There are some networks that have these kind of memory slots. Uh, Actually, they have no memory slots, uh, slots in the current states. There are some that actually do. You know, there are, you know, some have this special memory that you can use in recurrent neural networks. So, there you even go beyond my, uh, my, my understanding. But you know, there, there's lots of engineering that's happening. And I would say right now they're pretty simplistic uh, overall. But there are so many configuration already. And just when you use it for a recurrent neural network, where you have cyclical uh, feedback, you know, it's already extremely complex. And then the co co making it converge is actually quite complicated already. So uh, there's basically lots of things you can do already with this. And it's working pretty well. But People are, are keeping them relatively simple at the moment. Uh, sort of getting away from where the technical points, I noticed that the 25 years would fit with Kurzweil's 2045 singularity. I was just curious what you were. No, I don't believe it, but you know, I'm just no, putting right, it here. Don't <laughs> it. I was just curious if there was anything that would, would approach that in any way. And the other, and the other sort of 
other question the thing in the news is could NSA actually really analyze all the data and pull out agnostically connections between people and, and networks, et cetera, that uh, okay, just so look at the, the quantitative the, massive data. I mean, and, and the first question is, so the only, thing, the only reason I put this is that just in the past five years, really, it's just improved remarkably. I mean, and, and all using kind of a, because I think the holy grail is to have this universal uh, learning algorithm, which I don't think neural networks the way they are because they're too naive today, are, but just, you know, we apply the same kind of techniques to a lot of different problems and make a lot of progress. So it's, it's kind of striking that we can, are able to do that. Uh, and it just happens to be something that looks very much like the brain. So I think people should be a little bit puzzled by that. There's something happening that I don't think is going to be the same as what we saw. Because, you know, in the past, you had all these winters of AI because people made big predictions and then it didn't happen. I, I, my view is this is different. You know, I think this is for the long run. Now, in terms of NSA, I mean, it is actually amazingly, I mean, if you have access to uh, non-encrypted data, you can do a lot of things. I mean, and now with speech, for example, you know, the quality of speech recognition is very good and in many languages. So it's quite, you know, easy to just go on a pipe, transcribe all that stuff. You know, the speed of the system is pretty good. Converting, which they have done, you know, they have done, you know, they have translated and converted all these conversations. And then you can... I, I, because after you can extract it, you can extract names, you can normalize them, and so you can do some things. You know, there's I don't, the problem with these guys is I never know, you know, how good their systems are. But my view is the technology is there. Now, you know, government is pretty inefficient sometimes, so maybe luckily they are not as efficient as we think they are. But uh, you know, the, the, the technology is there uh, to be some pretty advanced things. So I I basically wanted to ask like. Is uh, Watson advanced enough to like detect uh, sarca uh, like sarcasm, like sarcastic statements, which like we humans uh, we generally detect uh, sarcastic statements uh, like in the context, right? So, uh, is Watson is your research team like able to get results uh, with sarcastic uh, statements, like uh, when we analyze a uh, gen like the statement as it is, it, it it's. It's sarcasm, right? So is, is Watson able to identify, uh, like? Oh, sarcasm. Yep, yep. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> not, not really. But I think actually that, so we have a team actually working on emotion detection. And you can detect, so the, you know, there is a service I mentioned about personality. And you can detect emotion. The only thing, so you can de detect emotion from, uh, from speech. You can detect it from the face. You can detect it from, from words. None of them is very good. That sounds like they are good at detecting obvious emotion, like especially in the voice. You know, if you're very angry, it's quite, quite easy. Subtle emotion, my view is that we'll be able to make some progress when we combine all three modalities. There's some good feeling that if you combine all three, all the evidences from you know, the words you use, uh, the face you make, and the tone of your voice, you can start getting some pretty subtle emotions, actually. Now, sarcasm is a little bit of a... I would say another level. But actually, I have a feeling that using these techniques, we'll be able to have to understand some subtle things. Because what's amazing with this network is that if you have enough labeled data, OK, so for example, you could fit, I mean, I've never done that, right? But you could basically take, it'd be interesting to do that. You take a bunch of sentences with sarcasm and other without sarcasm. I bet you the system will predict sarcasm much better than chance after. Actually, you could even use a system we just put out there that just classifies. It'd be an interesting experiment. But I, you know, you'll find some pattern of sarcasm and the system will find them. Now, the question is if it does that at 70% instead of 50%, is that good enough to do anything? That's, that's a more subtle problem. But. Uh, hello. Um, some people try to understand which, um, what, the, what, what, the, uh, which, what the layers in the neural network uh, may represent. Mm -hmm. And they found that the first layers uh, usually uh, for um, when the neural network is trained uh, with images, they represent uh, wavelet filters, mm -hmm. uh, which makes sense because it's built some kind of invariance uh, with respect to translation that's or right, rotation. Right, yeah. And my question is, um, when applying neural networks on text, um, the, uh, the, did people try to understand what the, represent, the layer Yeah, represents? Yeah, because you know, so we use, for example, I mean, 
there are lots of solid things. So, but an example of very simple is why do we use uh, convolutional neural networks, for example? So the idea of using convolutional <laughs> is because you want to use uh, work proximities, for example, right? So you know that you know words together. I mean, it's very simple if you imagine will actually have a meaning uh, together. So you'll find the pattern there. So you know, I don't I don't have a lot of insight, but there is things that we're trying to do like this, uh, trying to kind of understand constructions and even structure out of you know the structure of the network itself. Okay. My feeling is that sometimes for words it's a bit artificial because we're just looking. I mean, it works well. Okay. But we're just looking at, uh, basically, symbolically, the relationship between the words, okay? Whereas I think the real meaning of the words come from the experience, right? So if you say, if you think of a word like a cat, okay, all the meaning of a cat, how can you actually express what a cat does if you don't see a cat running around and jumping and stuff like that? So my gut is that in the next 10, 5, 10 years, we'll extract features out of the behavior and then label it. And that's where you know, the, the network will get, get a lot of depth. You know. And then we'll feed that into some more meaning uh, system where then you look at grammar and syntactic aspect that will be uh, extracted on, in, a, in a fuzzy way. It's kind of a fuzzy answer I give you, but because I'm not the guy actually building that stuff, you know, I'm just the manager here. So. Yes? Uh, I have a question about the Geopardy. Uh, did you train Watson on actual Jeopardy questions? And uh, yes. if so, did you consider generating uh, an infinite data set of questions? Because maybe it's a way simpler problem than answering the questions. And uh, just by calling Wikipedia, maybe not generating very complex questions with implicit answers. But no, the uh, answer is yes and no. Yeah, and okay. the reason is because, uh, and, and the way we did this is that they were very, oh, well, they did this, I was not even there. They were very, very diligent about keeping blind sets. So they kept a piece, of, they knew the data was extremely valuable, and they had quite a lot of history. You know, you're talking about, I think, something like 20,000 questions, which was, you know, it was a good set, and you could, do, you could do some good evaluation around, and they kept a big set of it that they would never look at, okay? That's, that's the important piece. But recreating them, you know, it's just, you never know. I mean, there's a lot of salties, and then there's the clues. The game has some dynamic because it gives you also a clue, so. But you know, they wouldn't have been able to do it without the history of the question. And that's something we're facing when we do real system is we don't have this first this contained domain and then all these example questions. So we're trying to put the system in, now what we're trying to do is to put the system in, in real life, get the interaction, and get some uh, implicit feedback from the people, okay, to give you some feedback on the way the, the system is doing. Which is pretty much what you know, Google does a lot on the web as well to just change the behavior of the search engine. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So I think this looks like amazing technology, but I, I have some uh, questions about this um, as a contribution to the science of language. That mm -hmm. is, what, what do you now understand about the nature of language that you did not understand before? So I have a, I have a controversial answer on this one, okay. So if you go around, there are lots of linguists who complain that our machine translation system are really dumb because they don't understand, and it's back to, you know, the, 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 when I showed it, because they don't understand anything about language. Actually, sometimes I finish my presentation by saying, actually, is there really something to understand? Maybe there's nothing more to understand. Maybe it's all this little clue, you know, this little signal, but any kind of theory you're going to apply to the language will be too uh, rough, actually. And when you go deep down, right, I mean, when you try to express you know, a deep semantic of the language, you always miss something. It's never a complete lecture, right? There are always exceptions. And then you try to, you know, look at all the exceptions, and then, you know, there are exceptions to the exception, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the, the proof in the pudding and the eating, when you try to design a system, we do something useful, by feeding these rules, you get almost no gain. Actually, it's amazing. Actually, the, the machine translation system today get from deep understanding of the, uh, of, of the syntax and the semantic something like, just a couple of points, okay, of, 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 of uh, I mean, sometimes not insignificant, but it's very, very little. So the question is, is there, is there more to understand actually about language? Because, you know, the language is developed for our brains, and our brains are a learning algorithm. More, they don't have like a theory behind it. So why is there a theory behind language? I mean, I don't know if you see my point here. Yes, I see it very well. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a bit controversial. I mean, you know, sometimes I wonder actually if there's all these quests of theory behind a lot of, I mean, 
I think physics has spoiled us. When you look at physics, you're like, okay, I can look at the world and it's very understandable. I can create all these rules that describe it very well. But maybe humans are not like that. Maybe humans, the best way to describe them is to reproduce them as a very good learning algorithm. And if you try to go deeper into the theory, you'll never catch anything. It's a kind of a you know, fruitless quest. <laughs> if you have more questions, uh, you can uh, speak to uh, Jerome uh, uh, after, after this. Let, this thank, let us thank our speaker again. Thank you.